back everyone for the final session of the Security and Privacy Miniconf. Uh, in this session, we have Christopher Biggs up first uh, with a talk on IoT. Following that, Lily Ryan with a talk on digital ghosts. Um, and then myself on indulgence with a quick talk about free IPA. And in the final session, Alexander Hogue talking about uh, politely social engineering with sneaky magician techniques. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Christopher Biggs and uh, his talk, The Internet of Scary Things. Thanks, Fraser. Wake up, computer. OK, g'day. I'm Christopher Biggs. I've been involved with embedded systems since my first professional role 20 years ago. And nowadays, I'm a consultant specializing in the Internet of Things, which is a new name for embedded systems that don't really work properly. I work with companies developing IoT devices to help them choose the right technologies and practices to build, test, and deploy their products. I've also worked in financial security. I spent six years trying to stop the high schoolers of New South Wales from accessing pornography during class. And I managed a department of developers working on websites and apps for internet gambling. So you could say I know a thing or two about shady people. Today, I want to tell you how to defend yourself from your toaster. Tom Eastman made a very good point yesterday about the key characteristic of IoT being that you're inviting a device into your home or office that you have absolutely no control over. You don't know what threats it enables, and you have no way of examining or updating the software on it. So first, I'm going to outline some risks of deploying IoT and talk about how and why those risks arise. Then, pretty much for shits and giggles, I'll tell you about some particularly shameful devices that I've encountered. Next, I'll cover what you can do to select well-behaved IoT systems, protect yourself from rogue devices, and if you're building products, I'll give you some points to keep in mind to event, avoid end up ending up in the hall of shame. Finally, I'll finish on a brighter note and tell you about some potential light at the end of the tunnel, the future of open source IoT. So first, I want to examine what are the risks. Late last year, one of these risks was really thrust to our attention when major social media sites were brought down by a denial of service attack perpetrated by a botnet of compromised video cameras. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. A, a disturbing portion of common IoT devices are easily hacked due to some really quite bad security on the part of the vendors. So our first risk is unauthorized access to your devices. If the device is a video camera, it's pretty clear what the concern is here. Embarrassment, exploitations, blackmail, burglary. But the threats vary by who the perpetrators might be. First, you have to worry about the people who have a malicious interest in you in particular. If you're a celebrity or if you have a vindictive ex or a creepy stalker, you've really got something to worry about. Second, much like how we're seeing self-replicating malware that sc scrambles your files and then ransoms them back, I wouldn't be surprised to see malware attempting to to harvest video and then blackmail the subjects. In fact, in the last presentation, we saw that this has already happened. Uh, would you notice if you were getting up to a bit of Netflix and chill and the camera in your smart TV turned on? Finally, there's mass data collection, either by randos driving around sniffing for vulnerable devices or by state level actors. Let's just say it's, it's a matter of record that the CIA has paid Amazon $600 million to build a cloud data center for something, and nobody knows what. Our next risk is unauthorized control of your devices. A proof of concept was done recently when some folks managed to turn off home lighting by flying a quadcopter around a neighborhood. You can bet somebody's working on the same trick for your front door. Vandalism is an issue too. I don't want to see someone work out how to wreck every garage op door opener in the city or switch off all pacemakers in this room. In terms of commercial infrastructure, it might be briefly funny if someone works out how to subvert autonomous computers into delivering free groceries at Woolworths or free petrol at BP, um, but it wouldn't be so funny if all the traffic lights in the city went green at once. So that risk we saw last year was mass takeover of devices. In that case, a collection of about 160,000 IoT cameras were subverted to perpetrate a denial of service attack against a major DNS provider. But there's other things that you could do with a 
fleet of compromised devices? What if your TV started showing advertisements that you couldn't turn off? Or your stereo informed you that your lights would switch on and off every 500 milliseconds until you pay 200 Bitcoin to make them stop? And of course, then there's plain old network intrusion. Most networks are set up to defend from the outside threats. But what if you just invited a threat into the building? Firewalls aren't good enough to prevent a device from tunneling traffic to the outside. We've got too many software-defined network protocols, too many ways to tunnel information. In home networks, devices can just use universal plug and play to tell the firewall to open some ports up. You need to stop thinking of firewalls as dividing the scary internet from the safe LAN. The monsters are inside the room. And if IoT devices rely on cloud services, then there's the risk of that service being compromised or impersonated to inject malware. Right now, you probably just want to bury your head in the sand. Or if you're a slightly clearer thinker, you want to round up all your household devices, go down to the beach, and bury them under half a meter of wet sand. You've got every right to be despondent. Many devices on the market are finicky to install, have low quality user interfaces, and no provision for maintenance. This is largely due to bad practices, and that's what I want to go into next. The security on some of these devices is just really criminally bad. It makes me wonder if some of these devices are deliberately broken. But Hanlon's Razor says, never ascribe to malice what can adequately be explained by stupidity. And there's certainly enough stupidity to go around. If you've been following Matthew Garrett's Twitter or blog, you'd have heard about his reverse engineering of various light bulbs and power devices. He's finding really lame practices like using XOR in place of encryption, or use of obsolete algorithms like MD5, or using strong crypto but in a dumb way that is easily um, predicted. And I've seen the same things in the devices I've looked at, which we'll go into soon. Then there's problems due to just sheer laziness. Leaving debug active access in production devices, hard coding default passwords that can't be changed, uh, using web servers that are vulnerable to command injections. One more thing that I want to touch on is usability. I, I completely agree with Pierre's point this morning that we as geeks owe it to our friends to design products that they can understand and use. It shouldn't take a four year engineering degree to operate a kettle. It's a fair trade, I think. We geeks make the world a better place and our more grounded, grounded friends remind us to eat. I do want to point out that this is, all this fail is not really an intrinsic characteristic of the Internet of Things. I firmly believe we can do better. We had the same problem in the 80s with Unix systems and again in the 90s when people first connected PCs to the Internet and then again in the noughties when broadband routers that you could break into with the network equivalent of a bobby pin the common culprit here is you. Well, not you, you, because you guys are here learning how to not be that person, but the enemy is us. And there's another way that IoT is like PCs in the 80s, and that's fragmentation. Everything is different, there's no reuse of services, and that means either you put more resources into building a good interface for every device, or you just build a crummy half-assed interface, and guess which they do. Once again, this is something that's fixable with the right industry action, and there is some glimmer of hope that that's starting. Finally, once you do get a device working, you've peaked. It's all downhill from here. Most devices have got no upgrade path, and in some cases, there's not even any useful brand name identification on the device. If there's a bug, you probably won't know. If you do know, there's probably no patch, and if you complain, there's probably no one who cares. So how did we get in this mess? Well, from one argument, it's, it's, it's not unique. Every barrel has a bottom. Other markets have rubbish products too. Next up, we're still in a very immature industry. Things are moving fast, and the technologies that exist right now aren't necessarily appropriate for the new applications. But this will change in time. Fragmentation is a pain, but we've got to get past everybody inventing their own wheel. The big incumbents have been pretty bad at this, and I can predict that some of them are going to get swept away by by uh, better entrance. Another issue is that security is just hard, and we know that because we're spending an entire day talking about it. There are enough script kiddies and organized crime rings out there, and it's easy enough to scan for devices that you cannot rely on obscurity to protect you. You cannot say, well, 
I haven't got anything worth stealing. Why would anybody break into my house or my cameras? Um, it used to be said that an unpatched Windows PC on the internet would be compromised in an average of five minutes. Well, when Rob Graham did this test with an IoT device vulnerable to the Mirai botnet um, a few weeks ago, he measured 70 seconds until first compromise. And a big proportion of these known vulnerabilities are in software that didn't even need to be on the device. It's easy enough just to install a complete Linux distribution on a device and ship it without bothering to reduce the threat surface. And this leads to vulnerabilities that we simply could have avoided. And in fact, sometimes I think it's arguable that there are better choices of OS, of OS than Linux for IoT simple applications. Lastly, there's almost no incentive to do better. If your IoT device gets turned into a botnet zombie, you probably don't even notice. If the buyer doesn't care, the vendor doesn't have to care. Okay, half time. Let's take a break from the doom and gloom to point and laugh. First, I want to tell you about the Mirai botnet and its victims. Mirai, which is the worm that perpetrated the denial of service attack last month, attacked a number of different devices by carrying around a list of about 60 different known passwords. The most commonly attacked device was particularly stupid because it had no way to permanently change the password. You could change it, but it would change back at the next reboot. And these devices used UPnP to act, ask the firewall to open too many ports. They contained too much software that didn't need to be there. Once you do break into some of these devices, you've got all the tools on board already that you need to turn them into weapons. Another camera that I looked at didn't turn out to be vulnerable to Mirai, but I still didn't consider it fit for use. It's got a Telnet server cleverly concealed on port 24, but <laughs> the password isn't documented. The seller wasn't able to find out what it was either. So I'm not going to put that on my network. The web interface for this camera simply told you, download this Windows XE file and run it. And it looked to me like the camera would serve standard RTSP video streaming if I can work out the URL. So none of this extra software really seemed to be necessary. Another tale of woe from a few years back, there was a low-end broadband router that actually had more features than it exposed in its web interface. And if you knew the right trick, you could act activate a Telnet login and use its CLI to get more value out of it. If you sent a particular UDP packet containing a particular string, it would activate a Telnet server with the default password. But almost nobody knew this, and it was there in every device. So if you're a malicious actor on the network, you can open the back door on the router that the owner probably doesn't even know was there, and they've got no way to stop you. I saw this happen in the wild where a router was taken over, DNS was redirected to another service, and it was injecting pop-up ads in all the pages. Last example, I've got a number of IoT devices that I bought just to see how bad they are. Um, and when you unpack one of these devices, they tell you to search for a particular keyword on the App Store and download the matching app. They don't even tell you what it's called. But thanks to App Scorters, there's 50 matches for that keyword. I found what I think is the right app, uh, but it doesn't work. Um, and even for the devices that do have working apps, they're, they're typically badly written and you never see an update. All right, end of interlude. Now I want to give you some constructive advice if you're selecting IoT devices. First, accept that you will get some duds. It's a pain to return the items, but that's what I recommend if they're not up to standard. You need to start looking out for unexpected devices on your, on your internet. At, at the CES Expo a couple of weeks ago, LG announced that from now on, they're going to be putting Wi-Fi in every single appliance they make, which means you buy a toaster, you plug it in, you might not even know that it's got Wi-Fi in it. This is a Wi-Fi enabled relay. It costs under 10 bucks, and you'll start seeing them appearing inside your walls, and you may not even know they're there. So look for, look for new devices that you don't recognize. Look for open Wi-Fi networks that have appeared in your house. And once you install a new device, port scan it to see what services it's offering. Don't accept devices that ask you to do unacceptable things. If they want you to, to, to run untrusted software, just, just say no, send it back. If all this sounds too hard, then avoid those cheap no-brand products. If you stick to items that are compatible with Apple, Google, or Amazon's frameworks, then you'll, you'll, in general, you'll have better luck because they're, they're typically a higher quality device. Another big example of advantage of a common framework is hopefully there's a common management interface, and that means only one hole in your firewall instead of 50. 
Another piece of advice is look for devices that support standard protocols like MQTT or have a well-documented API. If the vendor has thought about providing this kind of access, they're likely to be a cut above the rest. And you can Google around and see what we, the open source community, has done with the device. Um, this range of power control devices, again, is, is the Sonoff from a company in China called ITED. And all their designs are open source. Um, if you want to flash your own firmware onto that device, you can do it, they tell you how. So I've made mine in my home con compatible with the Apple HomeKit, which means I don't need to use their cloud service, I don't need to use their app, I can just tell my iPhone, turn on the lamp in the lounge room. So if it's been reverse engineered and it's supported by Homebridge or Node-RED, um, then you can restrict devices to talk to, talking to services that you control and remove that risk of, of untrusted third parties. And you should look at what other people have learned about the devices. Again, um, there are some people like Matthew Garrett who write about particularly bad devices to avoid, and Amazon is trying to encourage better quality reviews on their site. So look at the reviews for products. Now, even if you're not going to buy it from Amazon, go and look at the reviews. You'll typically find that a positive review is meaningless because people are doing that to get loyalty points or something. But if they've given a negative review, you can typically believe it. So supposing you've found a device that you're prepared to buy without wanting to slit your wrists, what next? First, put IoT devices on their own network if you can. If you're using OpenWRT on your router, you can just create a separate Wi-Fi network, make that entirely separate from your LAN. If you've got the stock firmware, you might still have that option. Um, and even if you've got a fairly crummy low-end router, they've typically got a guest network feature, and you can use that to sequester your IoT devices. Um, turn off support for opening firewall holes via universal plug and play on your IoT network, and if at all possible, if, um, if you're not a heavy user of, of voice over IP or BitTorrent, just turn it off everywhere. It's, 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 it's a risky um, technology, I think. Next, think about what would happen if a device went rogue. Um, an IoT device probably only needs to access one or two services, so if you work out what they are, you can limit the device to, to only being able to access those things. Similarly, you can limit traffic volume either by using OpenWRT uh, with traffic shaping or the child protection features of, of consumer firmware. And once you've installed some devices, you ought to check on them once in a while um, to observe their behavior. Check the traffic stats on your router once a month or something and just look for anything hinky. We're starting to see some consumer tools which will help you do this, and I'll tell you some more about those later. Once again, if you've selected the right device, you're not locked into the vendor's BOGO cloud. There's an open source project called Homebridge, um, which makes legacy devices accessible to Apple's home automation framework. So you can control them from your phone or your Apple TV. If you're using Amazon's Alexa framework, then there's another open source project called Node-RED, which lets you expose hundreds of different devices to the Alexa protocol. And for surveillance cameras, there's open source projects like ZoneMinder and Motion that support a pretty large number of low-end IP cameras. And basically, you let the open source ta software take over the high-end function, the higher functions from the, the rubbish original firmware and just treat it as a dumb image source. OK, I want to change tack now and give you some advice for developing IoT devices. Basically, it boils down to get someone else to do the hard parts. One choice is Apple's HomeKit API. Um, typically for Apple, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops to get their stamp of approval, but that also means that your product stands above the herd. If you're not going to go the route of getting the Apple stamp of approval, then do consider making a module for Homebridge, which can serve as an unofficial backdoor into that protocol. Um, Apple does the right thing by not putting too much intelligence in devices, but rather they let you compose them. So if you've got an Apple TV in your home, you can set up your house such that when this sensor activates, then this other thing happens, which means every device can be as simple as possible and have the smallest possible threat surface. It's less of a hassle to work with Amazon. They don't insist on device certification. Uh, but the drawback is that the Amazon hub technology, the Echo and the Echo Dot, they're only on sale in the United States and the UK at the moment. So the only way to get one here in Australia 
is to have a friend ship it to you or, you, or use a reshipping service. But I've really been a, impressed by the attention to security in, our, in Amazon's framework. It's built on the MQTT protocol, so you can have your own devices talk to Amazon's cloud services as well as compatible devices. In the open source world, there's been quite a bit of consolidation with two or three projects have joined forces as the Open Connectivity Foundation. Um, this group is defining a set of device profiles to allow us to reason about the capabilities of devices and for devices to discover each other. This builds on the good parts of, of universal plug and play and the service location protocol. So currently, when your TV um, announces itself to your phone or your BitTorrent client knows how to open the firewall, it's using service location protocol to do that. So we're building profiles to explain that this is a switch, this is a toaster, what have you. Anyway, moving on, please don't rely on a mobile app for setup. Sure, you can make one, um, but don't make it mandatory. Provide some way to do installation with an API or a web interface. The people installing a thousand sensors in, in a new facility will thank you. Similarly, support open protocols like MQTT. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, MQTT is a message bus technology designed to be very lightweight for small sensor devices. Um, and if you speak MQTT, you can interoperate with Amazon and Node-RED and a lot of other existing automation frameworks. Um, on device support, uh, recognize that everyone will lose the instructions. Put a copy of the instructions in the device, or at least a link to them. You need to decide what the support life of a device is going to be. Um, and commit to supporting it. And maybe if it's got higher functions that aren't mandatory, have a way to turn them off so that if there's a flaw in a particular area, people can shut that down. Last piece of advice for developing products, recognize that an IoT device is fundamentally different from a PC. You need to limit what software you put on the device. Now, this is inconvenient for developers, so automate around it. Make sure that, that when you commit code, your CI system builds a debug, a test, a production version of each release, and then you only put the, the, the non-necessary tools in the debug version. OK, almost finished. The last thing I want to go into is the light at the end of the tunnel. Various groups in the industry have recognized that we need to get serious, and they are doing things. There's a mob called the Broadband Internet Technology, something or other, um, which got Google and Intel and Microsoft and others on board to produce a recommendation on best practices. They published it in late November. Basically, they agree what I've been telling you today and what I've been writing about for months, which is don't be lazy and stupid. Um, I've already mentioned the Open Connectivity Foundation, and I, I really approve of the work they're doing. Finally, everybody's favorite security guru, Bruce Schneier, has been writing about IoT a lot recently. He thinks we need stronger regulation in the market. Um, I think this has the potential to go badly wrong, but I think if, if it were essentially an extension of radio emissions testing to include you know, good neighborliness for, inter for internet devices, then I could get behind that. Big news recently, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, is that Google has shipped a developer preview of their Android Things toolkit. Um, I had a look at this. It's not really ready for prime time. It only supports a limited number of device types, like light bulbs, TVs, and, and power switches, I think. But the technology stack looks really promising. I've told you about Apple's offering in this space. I won't repeat too much of that. Um, one more thing that's good with Apple is that they have a standard camera interface. So if your camera supports Apple, either directly or via Homebridge, then you can throw away the bundle interface and control your camera using your phone or your Apple TV. Amazon's framework is good, as I said. Uh, there's been some concern about how much it listens to. Uh, testing does appear to show that it only communicates to the internet when you speak the magic word. But given the track record with the United States, who knows if there's a backdoor there or not. Open Connectivity Foundation has a reference implementation called IOTivity. It's, it's, it's one to watch. I'm not really in favor of implementing IoT projects in C. Um, they also support C++ and Java. Um, I don't want to come across as a language snob, but to write secure software in C, you have to be really careful. Even experts stuff it up. And I want to throw one last framework into consideration, and that's called resin.io. They're open source, and they've got some really good tools. The gist of this platform is that you write in whatever language you want, and you push your code to a repo on their site. 
and then they compile it and wrap it up in a Docker container and send it out to your devices. The devices all maintain OpenVPN connections back to the cloud so you can monitor their status and do remote upgrades and reboots and shutdowns. Now that might sound heavyweight, but this runs Docker. The drawbacks are also that it only supports a small number of, of single board computers at the moment, but they give you full documentation on how to add support for your own. Um, it is really more aimed at enterprise devices than consumer devices, um, but if you're doing a project that fits within those parameters, you should definitely check it out. I want to shout out, lastly, to some technologies that will help consumers. There's a mobile app called Fing, which is for scanning your network. Um, ships on, on Android and iPhone. But they're also about to ship a little hardware device that you install on your Ethernet, and it monitors your network. Um, basically, it's an intrusion dissection system for networks without a sysadmin. I think it's a great idea, and it's, it's um, well under $100. Uh, there's also an offering from Ubiquity um, that's a little more high-end but does nice stuff. OK, home stretch. What's missing? I think we need to move beyond letting every device connect to whatever it wants. I want to see the device profiles from OCF and from Google include a network access policy that says what this device is allowed to do. There needs to be a secure and scalable way to let devices onto your network. Something like DHCP, but for getting a Wi-Fi password. Because right now, the idea of join some open Wi-Fi network and log into it and tell it what your network is, and then it turns around and joins back to yours, it's, it doesn't scale. And we need to work out how vulnerability al alerting will extend to the IoT. I don't think anyone else in my family is going to subscribe to bug track, honestly. And when we find a vulnerability, we need to get patches out to these devices. And there are a couple of frameworks who do a good job there, but I think we need a common standard. So, quick recap. Things are pretty awful, but that's not unexpected in a baby industry like IoT. If you choose devices with some care, you can install them in such a way to mitigate many of the risks. If you're building devices, you can do the right thing. The tools are immature, but some of them are good. And it's going to get easier over the next year as, as new frameworks mature, particularly the one from Google. So I hope you found that useful. And if not, I'll meet you at the beach with my shovel. <laughs> I'm currently working with a number of different companies to guide their products and practices. So get in touch if you want my help or advice. And thank you for listening. Fritz box, which allows you to set up a um, set of devices by MAC address, which you <clears throat> have put on a sort of secured LAN. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you know of any other sort of home firewalls that, like uh, Open WIT, any other stuff that al that allows you to set up that sort of untrusted bit of your network. Um, I have a TP-Link router, um, which I've recently put OpenWRT on, but before I did that, um, its firmware certainly had the ability to whitelist, the ability to have a, a guest network, um, potentially with a whitelist. So if you've got a, a relatively recent um, off-the-shelf router, then you'll probably find that it has those capabilities already. Uh, I, I actively do not want Internet of Things devices in my house, and yet if I want a TV, I have no choice. Like, you can't buy a TV without smart stuff in it. Yep. How do I survive in the future? Um, you, you find a little log cabin so far. <laughs> you find a little log cabin so far back in the, in the woods that they have to ship sunlight in by mule train, and then you um, drop your phone in the river. Um, Wi-Fi jammers do exist. Um, if you've heard of um, Limor Freed, who runs Adafruit, her very first product, which came this close to getting her thrown out of university, was a Wi-Fi jammer. <laughs> um, but um, my advice would be capture it. Create a Wi-Fi network that doesn't go anywhere, put it on that, and then it's not going to be accessible to anyone else. OK, uh, we are out of time. so. Please give Chris Biggs another hand of applause.